Of course, that sense of relief is a false sense of relief because I am involved, and you are involved, and we are involved. We are involved because that's what it is to be a church. Specifically, it's what it is to be a church planted right here in downtown St. Catharines. God planted us here because we are to be a sacrament of healing in the heart of this city. We're involved more generally because of our basic identity as the body of Christ, which is very simply the life of Jesus. And the life of Jesus is always involved when people are hurting. Now that's fine to say. It's fine to say that we're involved but how might we respond? What might a Christian response look like when there is violence and unrest in our community? I'm going to offer you three answers, and they're all related to one another, and they're all critically important. Now, the first two are obvious, maybe, but they deserve to be said anyway. Our first Christian response needs to be prayer. Scientifically, we know that prayer matters, that prayer has a healing and positive effect. It matters that this is a house of prayer formed generations ago, and it matters that you can feel that. When you walk into this building, you can feel that people have been at prayer here for decades, that prayer is soaked into the walls of this building. I like to think of that prayer that is soaked into these walls, radiating outward into our neighborhood, our city, our world. And then very literally, each of us who is gathered here on any given day to worship and pray together, it matters that we are then sent out into our own households, into our own communities. It matters that we do so with a commitment to aligning our hearts with God's peace. Our first response is prayer. Our second response is service. And you can also see that happening in this building on any given day. You can see that our words of prayer are backed up by actions of service. And again, it is scientifically proven that it is next to impossible to address more complicated social problems without first addressing basic human needs. Food, water, shelter. And so our second Christian response needs to be an ongoing commitment to developing and sustaining our programs here that feed the hungry, that provide water for the thirsty, shelter for the homeless, welcome for the nationless. That matters more than ever. Our third response is not as obvious as the other two. But I am going to say that it is just as vitally important. And in fact, our prayer and our service is substantially weakened if we don't take seriously this third response. This third response is at the center of today's gospel story. And it is at the center of the way that Jesus models for us and calls us to. It is, quite simply, conversation. Now, it's no accident that the word conversation is closely related to the word conversion. It's the willingness for all parties who are involved in a discussion to not just speak, but to listen, 
to learn, and even to change. Now, in today's gospel story, Jesus is approached by a woman who carries the weight of the world on her shoulders because her daughter is ill, and she needs healing for her daughter. And so, although she has absolutely no right to speak to Jesus as a woman, as a Gentile, as somebody who is not part of Jesus' race, religion, culture, tribe, she has no business speaking to Jesus, and she overcomes all of those taboos and plucks up the courage to speak to him anyway, because she is desperate. Now, Jesus' response to this woman might sound a little bit jarring to our modern ears, but it would not have sounded at all surprising to the ears of Jesus' initial listeners. He calls the woman and her people dogs. He says that what he has to offer is for the children of Israel. Nobody would have disagreed with Jesus about that. Of course you have to stick to your tribe. And of course, a Jewish savior is for the Jewish people. Where things start to get surprising, however, is when this woman persists. Essentially, she says to Jesus, you might think very little of me, but I am not nothing. And God's love and mercy is for me too. Most astonishing is that Jesus listens to her. Jesus changes his perspective because of her. Jesus sees in a new way how the love and mercy of God can't be contained in any of the ways that he might have assumed. He affirms her faith. He heals her daughter. It's not just Jesus who changes in that instant. I am going to say the world changes in that instance. The world changes when the ministry and mission of Jesus extends out to all of us. We can see through the rest of Jesus' ministry how he continues to alarm people by affirming the value and voice of the outsider. We can see in the book of Acts, which we're studying now here at St. George's, how the beginning community of the church has to come to terms in very practical ways with how they are going to welcome people who are different from them. And the reverberations of that moment echo down to us today, to any of us who are not of Jewish background and wouldn't be here included in Jesus' life and ministry otherwise. The church bears the imprint of this moment where our identity is claimed as a community who exists not primarily for ourselves, but for those who think that they don't belong. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled over the years trying to explain what is going on in this interaction between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman because it's assumed that somehow if Jesus is changed in this moment, if he didn't know all along that his ministry was for everyone, then somehow that challenges our belief that Jesus is perfect. I'm going to say that Jesus in this moment of listening and learning and changing is at his most perfect. Jesus is at his most perfect as a teacher, 
when he shows that he himself is willing to learn. He is at his most perfect as a healer when he shows that he is willing to listen to the voice of one in need. Jesus is at his most perfect as a human being when he shows that he is willing to be relational. And relational has to involve back and forth. It has to involve not just a willingness to enlighten and give to others, but also a willingness to receive enlightenment and guidance from the voice of another. How interesting it is that this encounter with the Syrophoenician woman continues with Jesus offering a healing for a man who cannot speak and cannot hear. And when he heals this man, he says this word. He says, aphasta, which means be opened. It's a command. It's a command not just for the man being healed, it's a command for us. A command to be willing to have the courage to listen and to learn and to change, to really engage in conversation. And it carries all the more weight because Jesus himself lived and modeled this openness. Now here... On this Sunday, following the shootings in St. Catharines, we know that there are a lot of assumptions about who was involved in those shootings and why. It really doesn't matter what kind of truth is or isn't behind those assumptions, because the command on each of us as Christians is the same. We need to be willing to engage in conversations with our community, our community that is hurting. We need to be willing to listen to the voice of the stranger. We need to be willing to see with new eyes. We need to be willing to actually hear what the hurts and what the hopes are in the neighborhood around us. Now, as luck or grace would have it, in two weeks' time, we are hosting our annual neighborhood barbecue. We've been doing this now for four years. And the neighborhood barbecue was conceived with that goal in mind, not to promote our programs, not to get more people to come to our church. We started the neighborhood barbecue because we're here in the downtown And we know that it's important to create a forum for community to be strengthened. And we know that the number one way of starting to strengthen that community is to be engaged in conversation. And conversation happens a lot easier when there's food and fun involved, which kind of gives us the model for what that barbecue is all about. In the face of violence in our community, each of us and all of us need to know that we are not powerless, that we do have a response. That response is powerful and it is of vital importance. And so going forward, I ask that you join with me in praying for our community. You join with me in recommitting to our acts of service here in the heart of downtown. I ask that you join with me in inviting strangers and neighbors and friends into our church. Join with me in opening up the doors of our community. Join with me in maybe making a commitment to speak with somebody that you don't know yet. Join with me in a commitment to conversation, listening, learning, shaping our response according to what we hear. 
and be opened. Amen.